And I'm really um, happy that Philip will be sharing his experiences and uh, insights about this topic because Philip and uh, Karin, um, his partner in crime for the organization Turfrei, and I believe also a partner in life, um, have done a tremendous job at getting uh, uh, peat-free potting soil on the map in the Netherlands um, and in a very short time um, managed to get a fair amount of uh, political change or at least anticipated political change uh, happening. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass it on to you, Philip. Uh, please take it away. Hi, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for having me. Karen and me are sharing a family, a company and an NGO. So uh, if we split up, the divorce lawyer is going to be very happy. <laughs> now, I'm going to build on what's been done. What's been done is mostly the content of what you want to bring across. Let's say you have an idea for a rights of nature legislation. That's the content that you have been inspired to, to work on the last few days. And I would like to discuss with you a bit about how to bring that onto the political agenda and how to basically yeah, score a goal with that to enact some actual change. And I'd like to ch jump straight into that topic by asking the question, why would Dirk Boswijk do that? Now the picture looks a bit like, this is the only Creative Commons picture I could find of him, it looks a bit like he's committed a crime, he's done something bad and now we are finding the crime scene, but actually uh, Dirk Boswijk's done something tremendously good. Dirk Boswijk is the parliamentarian who handed in a motion about a potential ban on peat in the Netherlands last year. So, <laughs> Why did that Boswijk do that? The question can be answered quite quickly. I would do that if I were in his position, I would do that immediately. So no question being asked, I could give you dozens of reasons. But in his context, it's a non-trivial question to ask because that Boswijk is part of the CDR and this is a conservative party. And this is the party which until recently had the strongest link to the pharma lobby and Dutch pharma lobby means industrial farming, meat farming. Um, he handed in a peat motion. Wow, why that? And also uh, a bit more context, they suffered a big loss in the last election and it was his first term as a parliamentarian. It still is. Now, why would Dirk Boswijk do that? And the presentation will be in plenary, but feel free to at any point, just jump in, uh, speak up. We're not terribly large, so just speak up uh, or put something into the chat to add something if you wish. Now, Dirk Boswijk, uh, what makes that special is um, Dirk Boswijk, I think, was in search of a green topic without stepping on the toes of the big pharma lobby. And Pete is a good one because Pete doesn't hurt the farmers. Pete, you don't see a truckload of Pete being spread around farmland. So it's a nice topic for them. And also it's a fashion topic. Now I put that in quotation marks, but considering that it wasn't really much of a topic a few years ago, there's a lot of people, a lot of politicians, a lot of newspapers speak about that nowadays. And that makes it into an attractive topic for a politician to pick up. In general, I think um, it's very valuable to look outside of your own bubble. Um, now, he would probably not the kind of person when I meet up with people I'm, I'm working politically with, I'm also affiliated to a political party, um, I would probably not meet with him on a, on a beer night out somewhere, but I think outside of your own bubble is where the interesting stuff happens. There's also very interesting stuff happening within the bubble, and of course the Pete Fest is a within bubble kind of event, but that is an event to generate ideas, but if you do want to make an impact, usually more is to be achieved outside because those inside the bubble are on your side already anyway. You might have to nudge them towards being activated, not only being on your side, but I think that this between the bubble communication is something which has really suffered a big blow in the last few years and something which um, we should be reviving, particularly in terms of making an impact. It's very often to be seen in politics that right-wing politicians launch left-wing politics, left-wing politicians launch right-wing politics, because you don't get into that, oh, typically them. That kind of argument doesn't exist for you. Now, an overview. I wanted to start with that topical appetizer. As I said, please interrupt me at any point if you wish. Um, but yeah, the overview after that topical appetizer, what we do today is 
perspective taking. We're going to do that at a couple of points. And on that, we're going to build up another topic. We're going to look into phases of a debate. How does a debate moving from being a non-debate to being a publicly available debate? And based on perspective taking, we're going to look into how we can adapt to a setting, to an audience, what that means for our arguments, what that means for our strategies. And lastly, you probably won't be able to do much alone. We also look like just two people, but we aren't. <laughs> so you need to recruit help. And we're going to see the exact wording, both words actually matter, recruit and help. We're going to see to that towards the end of the session. Okay. Um, a question that has been discussed before, a question I would like to pick up because it's the basis of our thinking of how can we actually make a change? Top down or bottom up? I heard in one discussion, ah, of course it should be bottom up. And there's viable arguments for it. There's actually also viable arguments for the other side. And I can't tell you which one is working better in your case. I don't know. It's too much dependent on the country you're working in. It's too much dependent on the setting. It's too much dependent on your resources. But if I give you the main arguments that we derived from that, then you can decide for yourself. We did discuss before doing anything, before even putting up a, a website, we discussed, we did some expert interviews. So we asked a few people who really have played the political arena for years, and we asked them, what do you think, bottom up or top down? And their arguments were contradicting each other, <laughs> but maybe also complementing. So bottom up, if you don't have public interest, no politician will do anything about your topic, quite obviously. Why would a politician do something that his electorate or her electorate is just not interested in? But also for top down, there's a lot speaking for it. Because people don't act against their wallets. There's only three to five percent of the people who would actually do something against their economic interest because they believe it's the right thing. But isn't the right thing the thing that we should follow? Isn't it that religious people follow their, their religious book? or that environmental people follow the environmental rules and follow what the IPCC, for example, is saying? Unfortunately not. Behavioral psychology shows, and this is a bit of a tough one to, to swallow, um, people, do feel what they people do what they feel like, and then later on find justification within their declared value system. It's a bit of a heavy one. I can give you an example for that one. Um, evangelicals in America largely are backing very loose gun laws. Now, so you are for like, hey, you should be able to go into Walmart, buy a semi-automatic and raise down your neighborhood. That's essentially what they're saying in complete and utter contradiction to the Bible. Um, of course, within a thousand pages, you do find justification for just about anything, but uh, it is not aligning with that, but it is aligning with their general gut feeling. Hey, the conservative cause that part of the political spectrum just fits better with my beliefs. Now, gun laws don't really fit it. So they're, first of all, feeling like, oh, that's actually cool. That fits the conservative agenda. It feels strong to have a gun in hand or whatever. And then later on, they take the Bible and find justification within that system. Likewise here, 70% of the people in Netherlands declare that environment things are very important for them. But if you look into what people eat, what people behave, how people are traveling, very, very few of them act against their wallets. If it doesn't cost them significant amounts of money, they wouldn't change. So um, that needs to be the basis of it. Make a, a choice bottom up. Yes, of course, you need to build some kind of basis in order to nudge politicians to do something, but that will be a slow and grueling process. Top down um, might be the way forward because then you can force people with laws, with taxes into a certain behavioral change. Okay, now looking into an example um, which was in the press the last few years, Greta Thunberg, did she have an impact? And I think it's almost a rhetorical question. Yes, of course she did. She made millions of um, not only high school students, millions of people around the world from various backgrounds. I'm also affiliated to Scientists for Future, so a lot of uh, other organizations have sprung up. Essentially, with a condensation crystal that she set out in the world. What is unique about her and what might have determined her success is she has very activating rhetorics. She's very loud. 
don't you dare. This is something which people usually don't say in the United Nations, right? <laughs> I do also think that she has a more effective, um, more effective picture she works with, a more effective narrative. If I may summarize the narrative, it's going away from a very technical perspective and it's more, hey, it's generational stupid, if I may kind of summarize her work. This is something that grips people. You always have your breakfast with your kids. <laughs> they look you in the eyes and say, hey, daddy, why did you buy that car? Daddy, why do you need to fly to Australia? Daddy, why are you eating your second beef steak tonight? Uh, that is a stronger argument than the abstract polar bear. And I think this is something she brought on the map. Now, if you look um, into the case, getting more specific into the case of Pete in the Netherlands, then our starting point was almost nothing, but it was not nothing. Our starting point was that 20 years ago, the drummer of the band I played in in high school times told me after starting to study uh, soil science, he told me, don't buy Pete, it's bad for the environment. Ah, okay, cool. And so I did, which was nearly irrelevant because I never had anything like a sizable garden. Two years ago, we moved to the Netherlands. And since then, we do have a uh, garden where uh, you can actually plant stuff and where you need to actually buy some kind of substrate. But we were shocked. We didn't find any peat-free alternatives. We looked around the internet, and this is how we got into contact with Repeat. Uh, Repeat was the only source where there was a collection of two <laughs> shops which are selling a peat-free alternative. Two. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Um, and only one of them was, yeah, it was nine case for me to go with a cargo bike to buy a bit of potting soil. This is not a very practical approach. <laughs> so, uh, wow, we looked further. And we saw that since 2014, so seven years before we got active, there was nothing in the newspapers, nothing on TV about that topic. And this now seems to get extremely, extremely odd. Peat was a non-topic in the Netherlands, although Netherlands is the second biggest peat importer after the US. It is a huge, huge horticultural country, uh, exporting flowers, exporting also potting soil, uh, a lot of agricultural products, exporting, although we are living on a very, very small space here, uh, exporting enormous amounts of food all across the world, but no one speaks about where that stuff actually grows. And then we researched further and we got more amazed even <laughs> because there's a lot of research happening in the ne Netherlands. That's a picture from Wageningen University, the leading plant science university, and they also do research into peat alternatives. And even industry does that. There's a lot of industry, actually more than in Germany, where peat is a topic. Dutch companies have been doing a bit more in terms of substance in replacing peat. But that is strange. <laughs> you have a relevant, very big topic in that country where a lot of stuff is happening, but no one speaks about it. So we thought, OK, we run a company together, Natural Science Careers. The main topic is science communication for scientists. So we thought, okay, now we have our topic. We let's let's try it out whether the stuff we're teaching people since ten years can actually be made to enact change. And so we did. And the first time we showed our face was May last year, and it was actually a pretty humble article. Uh, first of all, even published as a letter to the editor. And I give you the uh, the translation of that. Potting soil is a bag full of preventable misery. Now, <laughs> we had uh, the star Greta Thunberg with her loud activating rhetorics. I think what Karen did here is falling into the same category. It's loud, <laughs> it's activating. And I think considering that at that point, Pete was a non-topic, it fits it quite well to get people at least into some sort of action. And also, if I give you the subtitle of that, this is, uh, we're getting annoyed about, I'm reading out about the rainforest being destroyed, but don't have an eye on destruction happening in peat bags box in our backyard. So loud, it's a non-debate, so we have to be loud. And it did actually work. So just a month later, Karen got invited to speak at the Fruke Focus, which is one of the most popular radio programs on national radio, 400,000 listeners on average. 
and she got invited there just a few weeks later. Actually, she would have been much earlier, but then uh, there was the Shell uh, cold case, which delayed it by a week, and there was another motion from the uh, animal rights uh, party, which got us delay two happy delay weeks because these are very good reasons to be delayed with, uh, with such an interview. And now that interview in turn got picked up by politicians. So there were two parliamentary inquiries, one of them directly referring to that interview and a motion, the motion I talked about from Dirk Boswijk from a conservative party. And since then, I'm going to go back to the political agenda in a moment. And since then, we haven't been quiet. Um, we have publicized the topic. We've been on regional television. We have um, made our chicken famous <laughs> by an interview for Trau, one of the larger newspapers. And Karen turned from a biochemist into a gardening journalist <laughs> by writing an article on peat-free gardening in the major a gardening magazine where peat free gardening even made it into a sticker on the front page and as an immigrant to the wonderful country of the netherlands i'm very happy to have authored an article in volkskrant one of the major papers about alternatives to peat uh, gardening and we even made it into the libelle being mentioned there libelle is kind of the magazine you would find lying around at a hairdresser's place and if you have it at home then you will probably not speak about it. But even they do mention peat free. And by now, most uh, shops, most gardening centers do sell a peat free alternative at least. Um, some of them directly triggered after uh, we have been active, actively discussing with them. So by now, peat within just over a year is not a non topic anymore. It is a topic on the national agenda. Now, sometimes you do make a point, sometimes you do make an argument, but nothing happens. So you speak with someone who just says, I don't care. Now you make a very good argument. You do say, but peat box do store 20 percent, uh, 20 times more carbon than even forests. And we value our forests so much. So how can we do that? The response might be, I don't care. Ah. You try with more enthusiasm and you say, ah, but there's a sponge effect and we just had a terribly dry summer that can, can be alleviated if we have intact box around us or the, the floodings of last year in Belgium and Germany, uh, they could also be, ah, I don't care. You get a bit puzzled, you might have a, a different argument say, but it's completely nonsense in private hands, uh, I don't care. Or even if you get angry and you say, we are gonna die. <laughs> The response might still be, I don't care. But why is that the case? And the case is partly due to us sitting in a specialist trap. So by now, we know that we need to inform people and we need to be understandable. That's a progress because uh, 20 years ago, many communications from experts were around exposing status and not so much about furthering understanding so we're a step further but it's not we're not there yet just informing people sometimes has an impact i mean this friend of mine who told me that buying peat is bad certainly helped me doing something but in most cases the understanding is already there that we know that our behavior is creating greenhouse gases which in turn do of course heat up our climate we know that i think you really have to live under a stone not to live that uh, not to know that so informing might not be enough. So we have to take it a level further. We have to show relevance. And please don't do it with a polar bear. That's so unsuccessful. This is so not relatable. Do it with more Greta Thunberg kind of rhetorics. Show the relevance. For example, hey, this is for your grandchildren. This is for your children. Let's take it a level further. Showing relevance is sometimes difficult for us because let's call us specialists in terms of being really immersed in the topic of wetlands, peat. Um, many things might not, might sound trivial for us and therefore we don't think there's value in pointing it out explicitly. So showing relevance to people is hard for us sometimes, but it's even harder for us to show agency. Climate change is such a big topic. There's such big players working on it. How can I as a small, humble individual, do something about it, ugh, people feel lost and they feel lost for a reason. So showing agency can make a big difference. Having this hands in the ground kind of moment of, hey, you grow a plant, 
it's going to be more resilient in the long term if you use uh, sustainable alternatives, blah, blah, blah. This kind of moment is very hard to create with abstract topics like climate change, biodiversity. But if you do manage that, your communication will be very powerful. And the last point about how we sometimes miscommunicate is we overestimate how much we can achieve. If you think of people within various topics on a scale from very unfavorable to very favorable to our uh, viewpoints, then don't think about turning someone around 180 degrees. Do think in terms of nudging them a little bit on that spectrum, but there is value in it. So if someone is favorable to your topic, to, not, to get them to not only be favorable, but to actually do something about it, to activate them has a huge value. Or to have someone who's really, really hating your topic to get them to at least be passive is already a huge step forward to not actively work against you. So this is a few things that I see as sometimes our communication missing the point, aiming too high or aiming at the wrong aim of, for example, only informing, creating awareness. Maybe that's important. Maybe that's the point of that setting, but maybe also not. All right, now, um, exciting news hot off the press. The motion is basically made into a covenant. And I'm not allowed to show you the covenant yet. This is kind of a contract between the industry and the ministry and various other stakeholders like us. Um, and this is, I blurred it a bit, so you can't read it. <laughs> but this is part of the covenant text. And we have been involved in these discussions in the last 12 months and uh, have sat on the table with peat industry with lobby groups from various sectors now without showing you that there is still value in it because i have color coded that document according to what i like and dislike about it and where i do see our handwriting and where i do see the handwriting of a status quo oriented industry let's say who says oh let's have change very very slowly now we do see that it's a very mixed picture and that's not too unexpected, right? Um, the Is it sensible to sign that thing? Of course, the more parties are signing this, the more weight this document will get. And when discussing that with Karen, there were two arguments popping up. And the first one is obvious. With how many of the arguments do we agree? Of course, if you would only agree with 20% of that text, then you shouldn't sign it. It just doesn't align with your values. But that is actually not the determining question whether it makes sense to sign this document. I think it's even more important to ask yourself the question, will you have more impact within or outside of that group? So if we do sign that argument, then we can continue being very uncomfy for eight and a half years. <laughs> it's going to be a contract until the end of 2030. We're going to sit on the table once or twice a year at least, and they have to share information with us. So already for that reason, I think being a covenant party, being part of that contract will have value. You'll find out more about that towards the end of October when we're going to have a very nice trip to The Hague to sign that document. All right. Um, but a few considerations about that. Faces of a debate. We started that debate very loud because it was a non-debate. Now, it is a debate. It is a public topic. So our communication can and should also differentiate, at least in my opinion. To give you an example, um, there's a recent post we had on LinkedIn, um, and it is about cut flowers. Of course, a related topic to potting soil, cut flowers, as you might know, uh, most of them, if you go into a random supermarket and pick a random uh, bouquet of flowers, it's an environmental disaster. <laughs> you might better, uh, I don't know, fly to holidays or so. These things are usually grown in a, in a heated greenhouse or they're flown by airplane from Africa. So there's hardly anything which is more environmentally, destruct environmentally destructive than cut flowers. But still, we don't wanna just bash things. Um, so what we wrote is a part of that post, buying cut flowers a nice natural gift or environmental burden, the answer is, it depends. And then we give arguments why that is destructive and in which cases it is not. Amongst them also giving people, and this is the hands-on, the agency moment, showing people, hey, there is 
a flower calendar from Milieu Central, which shows you when to buy which flowers and when that in turn, of course, has much, much less impact, negative environmental impact. Okay, um, that is about the peat story. Now I would like to, um, I would like to shine light in the last minutes that I'm speaking about before the discussion about how to recruit help, because this is immensely important. Of course, the things that have happened in the last one and a half years in the Netherlands would not be possible with two people who are doing it next to their job. Now, um, you need to recruit help. And what I mean with that is don't just wait. Be proactive about grabbing people and asking them for a favor, asking them for information or whatever you need at that point. Now, we had immense luck. We, when moving to the Netherlands, we dropped our party affiliation of the German Greens and moved to the Dutch Greens. And one of the co-founders of the Dutch Green Party, Alexander de Roo, lives in our street. <laughs> and he's a European parliamentarian. He has really seen everything on the political agenda. Now, he onboarded us into the Green Party, and he is there for help. It's fantastic for us. It's a bit like paint by the numbers for us to do politics. Whenever we have an idea, we spin it by his table and say, like, hey, Alexander, what is the entry point for us? How would you do that? And then, of course, do you have contacts? Can we drop your name? And then we have 100% response rate when we can drop his name. But it actually also works if we can't drop his name. And that's the interesting part. You can reach out to people, even to very busy high status people, if you frame it well uh, in a way that they will respond to you. And therefore, I would like to, again, take this perspective. Imagine you have reached out to someone. We're going to look at this, how you do that in a moment. You reach out to someone and that person gives you half an hour of their time. But you haven't really known that person beforehand. Why would they do that? You can think about that for a moment. And of course, if you want to speak up, feel free. Well, um, I took uh, a little workshop in um, like coming from a perspective of a graduate and asking um, help from like professors or experts. And the response to this type of uh, question was because uh, so usually people just like talking about themselves and feeling like they're helping others. And uh, yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you do frame it in a way that, hey, you are the expert. I want to know something. It doesn't have to be humble, like, oh, I'm so small. Please give me a favor. But it is, of course, in a way of you have an expertise. You do know something I don't. And that is a pleasant one for most people. Yeah. And there's more reasons to it. And that will guide us into how you can frame such a request for an expert interview or other kind of low, uh, low threshold uh, support. They're also going to work on their network. So you might think, oh, I'm just a graduate student. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but also already as, as that, if you don't have a high status position, you are still a valuable networking node for them. And of course, you will grow in your life and you will grow with your activities. So if they have started by giving you a little favor, it's going to be very easy for them to ask you for a favor uh, later on. That happened a lot of times in my life that this became much more mutual in a short amount of time. People do feel efficient, and that's the great thing about it. I know many expert interviews which we have given or received where people just had this thought and were like, oh, wait a second, that's actually it. And then the whole story turns around, and you do start to, to think completely differently about how you do things. That feels very, very efficient. It feels like your time in giving that expert interview has really made an impact. And this is also feeding back into how you need to frame it, because you need to frame such a request in terms of, I've done my homework, I've got everything right, but there's one puzzle piece I'm missing, and you are the one who can help me find that puzzle piece. If you can frame it that way, uh, of course, not literally, but if you can frame it that way, then the chances of success are much higher. And of course, also, it's a generation contract. So people do feel like I have received myself at some point. Let's give that on to the next generation. And then, yeah, show people 
drop name if you do have that drop name uh, of people who you are knowing or people or at least some kind of connection very early on in the request and show that people do make an impact and then you just need to see that it's not anonymous and even if you don't know people they already showing them that you have research into it means that you are not a html anymore you're not just an email but you are somewhere already in a relevant area of a network continuum and you are being perceived as a person so someone where i know they have at least read what we have on the home page um, is of course absolutely justifying a response and that's with most of the people so we also do it for our company when we need to learn when we want to find something out when we want to move to a new market we're doing a lot of expert interviews and if it's framed well, if we do create that bit of connection, if we find a name we can drop in that email, ideally in the subject line, the response rate is extremely high. Now, one last thought. I've seen that there's already one question in the uh, chat. I'd like to move that in the QA after the talk. Define the scope of your activities. I think that's an important point to not overload yourself. And then you don't get anything done and you feel demotivated. <laughs> So if we now take us as an example, we are two people who do that next to their family. The, our hobby, if you want to call it that way, has grown out of proportion a little bit. So most weeks I'm spending more than 10 hours uh, per week, sometimes 20 or even more on to a fry. But that's, of course, next to family and job. Still, we are very limited in what we can do and what we can do ourselves by hand. But we do have a network of people around us who support us. We support each other. Still, the whole thing is quite limited. So if I may put into a slogan what we're doing, you can say you cut it down to political lobbyism, which of course also contains uh, publicity work. And we do that targeting the product level of peat. So we are not working on wetlands. We are not working on, on, on water levels, farm practices, um, not because it's not important. These Topics are even more important. <laughs> There's more to be gained if we work on water levels, for example, but it would just be out of scope for us. There's a very, very big lobby uh, against which we would have to work. There's a lot of people already working on that topic. So we decided to go for that niche topic, which fits the scope of what we can actually deliver. And that also means that the narrative we are crafting needs to fit that. Now, this is Irene, <laughs> you know her. And I hope you loved her TEDx talk as much as I did. Her TEDx talk is basically showing the beauty of wetlands and is showing that wetlands, please, Irene, correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially the narrative of wetlands is being changed from one of wastelands to one of a valuable natural resource. And now the interesting thing is that argument fits her purpose pretty well, I would say. But we are not using that a lot. We are, of course, hinting that biodiversity loss is bad. But we know that peat industry is saying, but we are only uh, extracting from formerly degraded peatlands. So it doesn't fit that well. We are not using the argument too much in our argumentation for that reason. But there's also the reasons that the Netherlands, and that's the politics we want to influence primarily, there is hardly any peatland left. So the argument just wouldn't grab. And in our case, climate, of course, climate, biodiversity, all these topics are super important, but climate just fits the purpose much better. <laughs> so what you can do, and that's maybe a bit similar to people find justification after doing what they want to do, you can do that, but in a good way with crafting your argument. You craft your argument, knowing what you want to do, and then find the purpose where it fits best. So in this case, the aim is climate change, which aligns better with politics. Okay, now to finish off, um, there were a lot of, particularly the quote with how people do react, maybe a lot of things which are a bit disheartening, maybe also things which are cheering up to see that we can actually make a change. I would like to finish on a very positive note. You know, this guy is a famous Dutch teenager i think he's not a teenager anymore <laughs> but that's boy and slut and while being a teenager still uh he thought can we actually do something about the tremendous amounts of plastics waste in our oceans and he started the ocean cleanup 
and they actually literally clean up the oceans recycle that plastic or at least use it for energetic reasons and now also do it on river uh, on rivers in the third world so fantastic impact i dare say the best and the craziest ideas come from younger people. There's a tendency, there's not a clear cut difference, but in general, young, the younger the people, the crazier the ideas. But also, if you really want to do a status quo breaking kind of idea, if it should be groundbreaking and new, it will more likely come from young people. But now we have a society where we listen to older people more than we listen to younger people. Now, I think I'm somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Now, I do think this is lamentable. Um, I think now most of you are rather on the young spectrum. Make yourself heard. Find people who would uh, back you. Uh, find people you can back yourself. Of course, this is a mutual interaction. But please, please, in your hopefully crazy, in hope, uh, young, maybe also old, but in your uh, crazy ideas, there is a lot of treasure city. Don't let them go unused. Okay, now to wrap up, um, feel very free to stay in touch. Um, we are linked, active on LinkedIn. On Instagram, we are making stuff in Dutch, so that might not fit so well, but in LinkedIn, everything's bilingual Dutch English. And of course, feel very free to get in touch at any point, info at Türfrei. I also have two sources for you. And talking about bubble or outside of bubble, please keep them in the bubble. <laughs> This is something about not arming the other side. Uh, one of them is the slide deck of today. And the other one is a collection of argumentations. If you want to go into argumentation strategies against someone who says, ah, oh, but using Pete is the greatest thing, then these arguments can actually help you. But for obvious reasons, it's good if that stays within the bubble <laughs> to not help the other side too much. Now, the last slide I put up should be the take homes so that it ideally triggers even more discussion. So my take homes are, you need to take the other side's perspective and adapt your arguments to the situation and to the setting. Not the argument which feels most truthful and most relevant to you, but the argument that is most relevant in making a change on the other side. Consider the phases of debates. In some cases, you need to inform. In some cases, there is still a gap of information. But sometimes you also need to be loud. The information is out there, but people don't act. Or you need to differentiate, or you need to build bridges. <coughs> Define the scope of your activities to prevent overwhelm and to actually get stuff done. Get help from experts, from peers as well. Um, do loads of expert interviews, speak with people, and um, build your network that way. And I'd like to finish on a very positive note. We are seeing a lot of anti-democratic um, movements. We are seeing a lot of lies floating around the world. And that is, of course, hindering any kind of debate. For me, the journey of Turfrei has been a very positive signal. We can make change and we can influence an open political system. Of course, there's lobbies influencing that. But it's not just big industry which has a lobby. Also, the small ones like us do have a lobby and we can use it effectively. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to a discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Philip, for this very um, practical outline of, uh, of your strategy. Perhaps you would like to stop sharing your screen so we can see everybody in the Zoom room. Um, oh, yeah, you should because... stop the screen share, okay? Oh. Falling apart. Uh, pardon me? Sh Sorry, stop my internet share? is, oh. I think, a bit laggy. Yeah, if you want to stop screen sharing, that'd be nice. Um, then okay. we can see yeah. everybody. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Um, I just have, I have one question to sort of build on one of the last things she said about young people having uh, the best ideas. Um, I, I would agree. <laughs> Uh, but I also think that as a young person, you're um, you're facing obstacles that maybe you wouldn't face if you're a bit older and you know you're Alexander Deroux and 
and you are sort of like you you look perhaps a bit more like established and and respectable and expert like um and i wonder like to what extent and i'm just curious to hear your thoughts on this like to what extent um this this tactic of just um reaching out and and uh asking people for opinion um, really works for everybody in the same way. Um, in the past, uh, I've organized also like, for example, local youth conferences. Um, and many times we were just completely ignored after sending an email. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you have any any sort of reflections about um, about this. I'd be curious to hear them. Now this sort of you define the scope of your activities, but also define the scope of your nosiness. Um, and I think there is something speaking for picking up the phone, for example. Uh, it's much harder for you to drop the phone and just disconnect in contrast to just disregarding an email. Uh, I do think you need to, in this case, reach the level that people really listen to your argument and not just not like, oh, yeah, this is nice. A student is contacting me, but that they actually listen to the substance of what you're saying. So you need to, maybe you need to go a step further than that. Um, but this is in this case, the same for me. Um, I need people to actually not only respond to me, but also to, to listen to my arguments. Um, so in this case, you might have to go a step further on the, on the networking spectrum. So, but if you do get to name drop uh, someone, and that can be just because you find that on LinkedIn, you find that in a, in a via via kind of connection, then people will listen to your actual arguments. And what you can also do is to find an actual supporter. I think for us, the thing is that um, I've discussed sort of the organization between individuals who do creative things, very self-organized and self-motivated, but maybe chaotic and therefore maybe impact less. And if you work with a big organization like Greenpeace, then it's got a huge, huge organizational head over it, which makes the whole thing slow. And I think to team up, in this case, Im imagine how rewarding that is. Uh, we very often hear that Alexander de Rowe is very happy to talk about Turf Rai because it's also a hobby for him, which doesn't cost him time. To team up, to find that, uh, someone with the overview and someone with um, the initiative to do something on the ground and yeah, the crazy ideas, I think to find these teams is enormously powerful uh, and to really work on that. I do see that there's a variety of, of people in that room. And of course, I think that there is enough scope already within the people who have attended this Pete Fest to build up such teams, but you can can reach out to such people, maybe also mix organizational things. I mean, we are part of the, the Green Party, but also affiliated with Scientists for Future. Um, that is also a source of, of contacts. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's um, really helpful. Uh, Bianca asks if you can speak more on the process of uh, understanding slash identifying one's niche, uh, which gap to fill and where one fits best. Okay. Uh, yeah, that de depends on the, of course, the, the scope that you have and your skills. Like in our case, it was science communication. That's the skill we bring to the table. The scope is, yeah, we might be heard maybe the background makes it easier uh we are promiscuous networkers we don't have a problem to reach out to people make cold calls so that's sort of the background and then within that where in the country is actually uh something to be made a difference to be made three years before starting to we were sitting uh during a summer holiday and we were like let's just do something let's just do something with an impact but we didn't find our topic. It took us three years to find that. Um, so we have actually been sort of, of course, trying to do the good thing with what we are doing day to day, but we haven't been active at all, but we have actively, actively looked for that, spoken with people, reached out, having some exposure to certain organizations. I think there is not the one size fits all answer to that. Um, I mean, feel free to, to stick around afterwards for a uh, one-on-one -one discussion, but this, this is just, get some exposure that people are able to speak with you, that people are able to get in touch with you. And then um, usually when you are visible, things are getting some some own initiative and some own pace. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Frankie? Hi. 
Um, so yesterday we spoke a little bit to this documentary maker about the dynamic between being like an activist and a filmmaker and a journalist and how that works. And I'm curious as well what you think about this um, science communication, like bringing the politics and the science together and how you found like navigating those, that kind of like complexity um, and also writing um, in, you know, newspapers and things and how you maintain your um, authority in that sense. Yeah, this is a this is a super nice, super difficult balance. I mean, us working with scientists is a potentially very powerful uh, target group, but they usually just shut up. First of all, um, they might be burdened with their own work, but it's also that they say we might lose neutrality that a scientist is just working towards the truth, which doesn't exist in absolute cases, but at least if you want to work towards that, then you can't take sides too much sometimes. Um, and that is hindering the whole thing a lot. I personally think we, as not being from that field, as not earning our money with that, this gives us the uniquely independent position. That comes as a cost of, of course, having to work ourselves into that topic, having to build up the network in that topic, but once we are there, you can imagine on that convenant table, I was sitting there like a gleeful child thinking, yes, I'm the only one who's not earning money with that. So I can speak what I think is the right thing. And you all have to basically guard your own interests. So I'm much, much more independent than you. If, you're a, if, if you are yeah, professionally active in something where you're also activist, yeah, look into your labor, uh, into your work contract, <laughs> I would say, <laughs> and do what's allowed within that. Maybe renegotiate that or find a different job. And if you are a scientist, if you are coming from that background, then I think there's an important level of the actual primary data. That should, of course, be as, as um, neutral and as sober as possible. But that is always being interpreted. And something like a... Um, an, a newspaper article or a, a, a pol parliamentary motion, this is going into the future. What could happen if? So it is, by definition, an extra extrapolation into the future, and no one can know that. And therefore, you just need to make sure you can speak out about the future, about hypothesis, if you make it clear it is a hypothesis and not scientific truth and it's not a, a peer-reviewed knowledge that you're communicating at that moment and then even as a scientist you are much freer to speak about a broader set of topics yeah it's uh, it's interesting that you say that of course like um yeah you have a lot of independence in your position and even though perhaps it has the cost of having to juggle it alongside your work and your family um there's a lot of sort of integrity that you gain with it of course uh, and a lot of um, freedom of speech and to actually stand stand up for what you believe needs to happen rather than that what will uh, make sure that you get your next paycheck. Um, it, is, it, is, it is the, the Matthew principle, the Matthew from the Bible, eh, um, who said those who have will be given, but it's <laughs> tongue in cheek a bit, but it is actually usable for other things. The funny thing was Dirk Boswijk, we phoned with him and he said, give me the details for that motion. We wrote half the motion because he thought we are the whatever people because we had a radio interview <laughs> so you can't create that flex uh, that credibility you have to of course stick with it we have basically phoned like crazy with other scientists like is that correct is that correct can you give us data for that it's that's where it comes from but of course we have basically given a bit of a head start in in credibility of course we have to live up to that we can never publish a lie we can never publish something which is half-baked um that, of course. Yeah. So that could also yeah. happen to younger people, I think. Uh, yeah, if you are visible, like, hey, you have worked for three years building up repeat, and of course you do gain credibility that way as a peat expert. Mm. There was also yeah, Bianca, uh, sorry, uh, who wrote, what do you mean by reaching the level? I don't know what... That was before uh, when I, I think... Uh, Frankie or Irene asked about like how to um how to like gain a, a authority or something or, or I, I don't know okay. but you said something like once you reach that level you can go and start asking people so I was wondering what the the level was but okay. I, I don't remember exactly what you said so 
Okay. Uh, just, um, yeah, it's quite astonishing, like, how how easily people buy sort of into the the idea of, of expert or authority. It's sometimes you don't even have to be so much, but as long as you, you give up this impression, uh, half the time people won't even check if it's actually true. They just go with their gut feeling. Um, it's it's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's um, we, we do both have science PhDs, um, but not in that field. This is the that might have been part of the credibility we yeah that he believes we are peat scientists <laughs> yeah yeah um one question from my side and then i'll pass to frankie and perhaps then we will have to wrap up uh, i asked in the chat earlier but if this confident at getting signed what was like what were the main points of dispute like the main ones that um, you had to sort of find an agreement over the Convenant was a very interesting multi-stakeholder um, discussion format. It is a one-text procedure. So there is a mediator who is basically listened to all sides. Um, all sides can present, then all sides discuss, uh, and then the mediator goes back and writes a draft solution. And then you go back and discuss that, uh, you criticize that, and then the mediator goes back and writes version 2.0. And then we went to put version 3.0. And at that point, people can decide to sign it or not. Um, so just to understand the process. So it was the elegance of that is you don't need to discuss out a solution at that point. But you can basically say, I disagree with it, hoping that the moderator takes that up. Um, and if your argument is good enough, it will probably do it. And if not, it will probably not do it. And we did have the um, a fantastic uh, mediator for that, who actually has a background from the Favi Day, so another right-wing party. He has done a fantastic job, and I truly believe that he was neutral in that process. Uh, yeah. uh, the main points of contention are, are alternatives available? This is incredibly big point, um, where we do say, if you have to, you will create that market, and now there's a big competition between biomass combustion for energy and production of soil products. Soil products are the higher value thing. So once you stop subsidizing that, it will fall in place anyway. Uh, it will be an easy one and the market will move if it has to. I mean, now people can buy a bag for 350, then they will have to pay at least a floor price of five euros, but then that's just it. Then they don't waste so much of it. So availability of alternatives is a big one. Uh, and of course, the uncertainty due to um, war, energy markets, that kind of stuff, which is might be a killer argument, certainly also has some substance, but these were sort of, you can't give targets for 2050, for 2030. Yeah. So we're happy that there's at least something for these larger time uh, frames in the, in the Convenant. Yeah. Right, very interesting to hear these, these details of the process. Uh, Frankie? Thanks. Um, I just had one more question about like sticking points um, in terms of mm, what you said about breaking the bubbles and like starting these conversations with different people that are very like uh, from a different political or like worldview perspective. Um, and I think this is something that we as a group should also be moving in to, to try more or like in my in my opinion. Um, and I was wondering if A, you have some like tips for this and like B, you have some like examples of where it can go wrong um, in your experience of speaking to people um, and like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if there's an out bubble, let's say <laughs> kind of event, then yeah, just go there and, and try to get in touch with these people. We have also asked Alexander, that was one of the, the most moments where we had to hold our nose. We asked him, who shall we get on board? Because we need to drum up support for that motion. And he said, uh, go to the, the green-ish kind of politician from the Pei Fei Fei, and that's right-wing extremist party. And that's the guy who also had, at that moment, a case of a rape case on hand. Um, so it was not proven that he did uh, do sexual harassment or even rape in his office. 
but he was still in office uh, and he was the one who inf could influence that party. Now, Alexander told us, also reach out to him and try to get him on board to uh, support that motion. <laughs> we tried, he, he never responded and they voted against it. But in this case, yeah, you can try. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Fair enough. There's one principle from negotiation logic, um, which I find helpful here. And this is separate people and problem. In this case, um, the people side is something I would, in this case, I would say, okay, if he votes for it, he's still a bad guy, but he's done something good and he helps that motion, fine. If he scores a political point, this is a tactical question I can't judge. So I have to trust Alexander in this case to tell us the balance between giving them a political uh, bonus points and that the balance is okay. It, but it does mean that um, when I speak with people where I have to hold my nose, that I still um, respect them as people. I still try to see why they do what they're doing. And for example, when speaking with uh, Klossmann Dielmann, the biggest peat producer in the world, um, I also have to hold my nose a bit, but I need to understand what is their industry? What are the, the kind of yeah, boundary conditions that they have to face? And yeah, in their case, yeah, there are a few things you can understand and yes, they are um, in some ways credibly trying to trying to move in the right, right direction. Um, and problem is then what you want to want to bring across. So I try to separate the two and try to, in this case, focus on the problem. And if they get a brownie point by the interaction with me, it's fine. I don't try to fight against them to the level that I say they shouldn't even get a, a plus point or they shouldn't score a green point with their voters. Uh, because they are hmm. yeah so focus on the problem and the the people should be respected as such but if there is something personally you don't like about it try to push that away uh, from you at that moment <laughs>